Shalom again. And I'll say Shabbat Shalom again. Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat Shalom to anyone who may hear this. We are blessed today to have a full house, which is nice. And I think it's really, really neat seeing all the banners around. It uh, just shows the, the priesthood. A couple of months ago, I had the blessing of uh, going up to uh, Mount Carmel and meeting with uh, one of the leaders of the Druze who's been a Knesset member in and out for the last 42 years. And this man uh, actually worked with uh, Amra, Ammar Sadat and also uh, Benaki Begin and the peace deal in the 70s. And he was at actually the liaison. And he showed us this room he had and it had 50 king chairs around there where all the dignitaries would sit as they would come in. And he had pictures in the whole room of everybody from Ariel Sharon to begging to every Prime Minister of Israel. And uh, it just reminds me of that when I see all the, the royal banners of the tribes. It's like sitting in a, a room of royalty and I think it does really, really nice to Yahweh. And again, we will say thank you to Denise and whoever else helped her with that. But, uh, wow, you know, if you look at these banners and don't think we're serious, I don't know what, what, what then. But, uh, Today I want to talk about a subject that I probably should have talked about many, many moons ago. I have on, on certain tapes here and there, but never really extensively. And uh, I was going to call this uh, the family of Elohim, but I'm going to call it the power of Elohim because I'm going to do a separate message just showing the family of Elohim in, in, in Scripture. This one's going to be a little bit different. I'm going to touch on the family of Elohim, but I'm going to show, I, I really want to talk about the power of Elohim and the concept of the Trinity Doctrine is what I want to touch on more than anything. And in Scripture, you know, I've read this many times, and you've read it many times. Many are called and few are chosen, right? Many are called and few are chosen. But chosen for what? What are we chosen for? Let's go to Romans 8. We'll start there, and we'll see that. What we are chosen for is to be family members of the living Elohim of the universe. Romans 8 and verse 14. It says, For as many as are led by the Spirit of Yahweh, these are the sons of Yahweh. For you did not receive a spirit of slavery again to fear, but you received the spirit of sonship, by which we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit itself witnesses with our spirit that we are children of Yahweh. And if children also heirs, truly heirs of Yahweh, and join heirs of Messiah, if indeed we suffer together, that we may also be glorified together. You drop down to verse 29. It says, And he knew them in advance, and he sealed them with the likeness of the image of his Son, that he might be the firstborn of many brothers, by whom he marked in advance these also he called, and whom he called those also he justified, and whom he justified these also he glorified. We know in 1 John uh, 2 also it says, We don't know what we'll be like, but we know that when he appears we'll be like him for we'll see him as he is. So, clearly, and it, it's a mystery to me, the same way that when you tell people the name of Yahweh, if for whatever reason people reject it, you know, and I've never seen anyone ever in the history of man ever fight and reject when a human came up and said, hi, my name is Paul, my name is Jim, my name is Don. Someone say, no, 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 that's your, not your name. Yet 7,000 times Yahweh tells us what his name is. And people fight it and they're against it, which shows me it's got to be a mystery. There's a spiritual element that that is closed the minds of man that they don't understand. And I think the same thing here. That when you look at scripture, how on earth can't you come out with the fact that Yahweh is a family? I mean, he calls himself Abba, Father. That literally means like daddy. And he calls us children. And Yeshua calls us brothers. What is a family? You know, I mean, isn't that a family? So, but people say, oh, I heard you talk about Yahweh being a family, but I just don't see it. 
I said, I'll pray for you. <laughs> you know, I mean, what else can it be? What else is a family than that? But clearly we see here that we are children of Yahweh when we're begotten with the spirit of baptism or immersion, and we are a living embryo. That's what we are. We're like right now an embryo in a mother's womb. And literally when Messiah returns, we're going to be born again. Like I like just read here, Yeshua is the firstborn of the dead. So whether we're alive in his coming or we sleep in the dust, when he returns, we're going to be born again to spirit and literal family members of Yahweh. Uh, that's what it says to the first resurrection. If you look at the second resurrection in uh, Revelation 20, it never tells us what the potential of those people are. We just know the books of the Bible are open and they're judged from their works. You see the same thing in Romans 2. And some people will get eternal life, some go to the lake of fire, but we don't know what their potential is. It never says they're children, it never says they're family members, it never even says that they're spirit. You know, will they be like Adam was, a creation, a glorified human? I don't know. We don't know enough evidence. Uh, I'll probably talk about that in Sukkot. On the last great day, I'm putting something together. But at least we know they're going to be in the kingdom. But we know one thing. As a first fruit, it's called the better resurrection. You know, that we have a better potential. We know for sure in the first resurrection that we're called family members. We're called children. Uh, Hebrews 2 in verse 10. Hebrews 2 in verse 10. And I'll read 10 through 13. For it was fitting for him, talking about Yeshua, because of whom are all things and through whom are all things, having brought many sons to glory, so that from the very beginning of their salvation they are made perfect through sufferings. For both the ones sanctifying and the ones being sanctified are all of one nature, for which cause he is not ashamed to call them brethren, saying, I will announce your name to my brethren, I will praise you in the midst of the congregation. From Psalm 22. Again, we see the family aspect, Yeshua calling them brethren, as first fruits and family members. And what I've said before, and I'll say it now, Yahweh is an open-ended family. Anyone can join. You know, He has chosen the physical seed of Israel to bring salvation to the nations. But now that uh, you know Israel is being regathered from the four corners of the earth, anyone in any nation on the earth that has a heart toward Elohim will repent of their sins, accept the blood of Yeshua for the forgiveness of those sins, can join the family of Israel. You know, anyone. It doesn't matter where you come from. So he's an open-ended family. And salvation is open to anyone on the earth uh, that wants it. But when you look at the Trinity, the Trinity is a very closed-end thing. You know, when you see Father, Son, Holy Spirit, they're all intertwined, they're this, they're that. We're going to talk about that in a few minutes. But it's closed in. We have no part in the Trinity. You know? Yet with the family aspect, we all have a part. We just read it. That all of us have the potential to actually be family members of the Yahweh family. And that's why he's going to be our father, you know, and we're that embryo now. And in the kingdom, we're going to be co-heirs. Co-heirs of the universe. I mean, those are big words. Hard to grasp sometimes, but they're there. They're right there in Scripture. But with a Trinity, you don't see any, anything like this. If you look at where the Trinity came from, you'll see all the way going back from 4,000 years ago, whether it's Babylon, whether it's Egypt, whether it's Rome, you always see this idea of a triune Elohim or a triune God. Uh, modern Trinitarians mostly come from Mithraism, which is sun worship, and it had Mithra, Rashnu, and Vohumanu, who were the three, the three gods of that trinity. Now, Here's the point that I've said before that I want to make very important because I believe that most people who say they're Trinitarians really are not Trinitarians. Because usually when I explain to someone what the Trinity really is, and again, there was no, you don't find the word Trinity in the Bible. It started to come up in, in, in the Council of Nicaea. Remember Constantine? Where Sunday worship and Christmas, that's the first time Trinity is mentioned is at the Council of Nicaea. And what the Trinity doctrine is, you could look in the Catholic Encyclopedia, you could read it for yourself, that's where it comes from, the universal or Catholic Church. It says that, uh, that Elohim uh, is one with three hypostases, is the word that's used. Hypostases, which is like aspects of him. So there's one Elohim, and he has three aspects. And they'll use uh, as examples the sun. If you look at the sun, you have the sun, 
And then you have the rays of the sun and the brightness of the sun. But let's be honest, how many suns are up in the sky? One. One sun. They use an egg as it. You know, you have the egg and then you have the shell of the egg, you have the yolk of the egg, you have the white of the egg. But again, go in your refrigerator and you pull out an egg. How many eggs is it? One egg. And really, what, what the Trinitarian doctrine does is it denies that there's a father and a son. It denies it. So when I explain that to people, no, 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 that's not what I believe. What most people believe is not the Trinity. Most people believe that there's three Elohim. Elohim the Father, Elohim the Son, Elohim the Spirit. Now again, I do not believe that's correct, but I don't believe it's as dangerous as really what the Trinity is. Because again, when you're believing in the Trinity, you're denying there's, there's a Son. Uh, if we look at 1 John 2, 1 John the second chapter, And I'll read verse 22 and 23. It says, Who is the liar except the one denying that Yeshua is the Messiah? This is a anti-Messiah, the one denying the Father and the Son. Everyone denying the Son does not have the Father. The one confessing the Son also has the Father. And this is started coming up in the 3rd century. One of the reasons this came up at the Council of Nicaea is because of a man named Arius. Arius, who was a heretic, who was denying Yeshua's deity and saying that he wasn't part of Yahweh. But this is a teaching that's very alive today, and especially in South Africa. Sorry to say, many South Africans believe in the oneness doctrine, that Yahweh and Yeshua are the same being. I have many tapes on that, and it just is not true. There's more than a hundred scriptures easily. I'll go over a few of them here, but it's not my purpose of this message. We have it in many other messages. But clearly, the Father and the Son are not the same being. Yeshua said the Father is greater than I. You know, Yeshua clearly made the distinction. Yeshua had a free will. The Father has a free will. So they are not the same being. So when you're embracing, you know, really the fullness of the real Trinian doctrine, that's what you're doing. You're taking the doctrine of anti-Messiah. And again, anti-Messiah is not against the Messiah. The word anti means in the place of. So that's what you're doing. You're replacing the Messiah with this oneness doctrine or whatever it is. Again, which is not scriptural. Revelation 22. This is usually where I'll start with somebody who's into the oneness doctrine. Because the bottom line is, because when you show them all the scriptures in the Bible, then they come up with this other thing. Well, this is the human Yeshua, and this is the divine, and it's like, where are you getting this from? It's a paper that some heretic had put together to try to explain away a hundred different scriptures. So we say, okay, let's just go to the bottom line. Let's look at Revelation 22. After everything is over, after the New Jerusalem's coming down, and let's look what it says here. Revelation 22 and verse 2 and 3. In the midst of its street, talking about the New Jerusalem, and the city, on this side and on the side of the river, was a tree of life producing twelve fruits, according to one month each yielding his fruit. And the leaves of the tree were for healing of the nations. And there was no blight anymore. And the throne of Yahweh and the Lamb will be in it. And his servants will minister to him. So when everything's over, there's the throne of Yahweh, there's the throne of the Lamb. I mean, I found when I was doing the Bible translation at least 12 or 13 references. I'm not going to read every one here because I want to get into some other things that clearly show in heaven right now today Yahweh is sitting on a throne. Yeshua is at his right hand. And Yahweh isn't sitting there like this. <laughs> That's not what he's doing. It's not him sitting there putting his hand like that. Literally, the person of Yeshua Messiah who came to the earth as a physical human being for some odd 30 years, 32, 33 years, who suffered, who was crucified on our behalf, who was resurrected by the Father, which is another problem. If Yahweh and Yeshua are the same person, did he die? And if he died, who raised him up? But Psalm 16 says that Yahweh says to the Messiah, I, Yahweh, will not leave you the Messiah, your body in the grave to see corruption. Peter mentions it in the first uh, uh, sermon on Shavuot. In Acts the first chapter, in Acts the second chapter, we see it. So clearly, the Father raised Yeshua up. They're not the same being. They're the same spirit, and that's what we're going to talk about today. But they're not the same being. Uh, let's go to Hebrews 10. Hebrews 10. We'll see this again. Uh, 
And I'm telling you, some of these doctrines that may not seem so important at the time, what happens is where you see where they lead to, that's where the dangerous part comes into. Clearly, this is a very, very important subject. Hebrews 10, 12 and 13. But he, Yeshua, offering but one sacrifice for sin, sat down in perpetuity at the right hand of Yahweh. Yahweh sitting on his throne, Yeshua is sitting at his right hand. From then on, expecting until his enemies are placed as a foot still under his feet. Where does that come from? Psalm 110. So go back there. Psalm 110. That's what this scripture is quoting. Psalm 110. I'll start in verse 1. A Psalm of David, a declaration of Yahweh to my Adonai. A declaration of Yahweh to my Adonai. Now what's very interesting is when you see the word Adonai, it comes from the word Adon, which literally means master. So whenever you see many times, probably a thousand times in the Bible, you find this word. But most of the time, whenever it's Adon, it's to a human being. But whenever you see it in the plural, to Adonai, it's only to Yahweh. It's only deity. You will never see the name Adonai to a human being. So here, it's saying a declaration of Yahweh, the Father, to my Adonai. David is calling this Messiah his Adonai. Sit at my right hand until I place your enemies as your footstool. This is what Yahweh is saying to David's Adonai, the Messiah. Clearly two separate beings. Yahweh shall send the rod of your strength out of Zion to rule in the midst of your enemies. Your people shall have willingness in the day of your might and the majesties of holiness from the womb of the dawn to you is the dew of your mouth. Yahweh has sworn and will not repent. You are a priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek. Yahweh again talking to the Messiah. Yahweh at your right hand. Now the Messiah is actually called Yahweh. So first he says to David's Adonai, sit at my right hand. And in verse 5, he literally says, Yahweh, the Messiah, at your right hand, shatters kings in the day of his anger. And maybe the oneness will say, look, see, same person, no. Because Yahweh is a family. Yahweh is a family name. Clearly in Scripture we have at least 12 to 15 references to call the Father Yah Yahweh. And we know from the New Testament and even the Old Testament, I have somewhat 100 Scriptures from the, from the Tanakh that personify Yeshua in His name Yeshua. So you have Yah Yahweh the Father, Yeshua Yahweh the Son. Pretty, pretty clear. Two beings that are one in thought, in mind, in, in purpose, in love. Hebrews 8, 1. Back to Hebrews. I'll just read it quick. You don't have to turn there. Now the sum of the whole thing is this. We have a high priest who is seated on the right hand of the throne of the majesty in heaven. We just read. Pretty simple. We have a high who's seated at the right of the throne. Yahweh's on the throne. He's seated at his right hand. This is going on in heaven. So you, they, they can't mishmash these analogies of the earthly one, the heavenly one, and play this little shell game like they like to do. Clearly, there's a Father in heaven. Yeshua is sit, seated at his right hand. I'll read the last scripture. I'll read on that is 1 Corinthians 15, because it's not Yeshua and the Father that I really want to talk about today, but it's the Holy Spirit. 1 Corinthians 15. I'm going to start in verse 20. First Corinthians 15 and verse 20. And I'll read down to 28. But now the Messiah has been raised from the dead. He became the first fruit of those having fallen asleep. For since through man came death, also through man is a resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, so also in Messiah all will be made alive. But each in his own order. Messiah the first fruit, afterward those of Messiah at his coming. Then is the end, when he delivers the kingdom to Yahweh, even the Father... <laughs> Clear distinction. When he makes to cease all rule and all authority and power. For it is right for him, the Son, Yeshua, to reign until he puts all enemies under his feet. The last enemy that shall be destroyed is death. For he subjected all things under his feet. But when he says that all things have been subjected, it is plain it accepts him, the Father, who has subjected all things 
to him, Yeshua, the Son. But when all things are subjected to him, to the Father, then the Son himself also will be subjected to the One, the Father, who has subjected all things to him, that Yahweh may be all things in all. And Yeshua clearly said it, the Father is greater than I. But the Father is not now coming down and dwelling in sin. So what does he do? He sends the Son down during the millennium and says the Father does not come till the millennium is over. So it is Yahweh the Son who is coming here and reigning for the thousand years until he puts every enemy under his feet, the last enemy being death. And then when all that is taken care of, we see in Revelation 21, then the Father, Yahweh himself, comes and dwells with the sons of men, the first five verses. Clearly, 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 two separate beings. And again, I have full tapes on this. If anybody wants to uh, have them, you can download them from the website. You can write to us if you want them sent. But uh, again, whenever you're talking about the relationship of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, I, I do have to set this foundation, at least in the beginning, because again, there are many people who are claiming themselves to be messianic and, and a lot of other things that uh, are claiming that either the Father is one and the Father and the Son are the same being, you know, or Yeshua never pre-existed, you know, he was only born, came into the earth the first time from Mary, which is even more uh, shocking. There's so many scriptures in the New Testament that says, you know, that no man has ascended to heaven except he who came down from heaven, even the Son of Man. You know, Yeshua clearly, John 8, 56, what did he say to the, the Pharisees? You know, you are yet 50 years, you're not even 50 years old, and you know Abraham, what did he say? Before Abraham was, I am. You know, he, he clearly was showing that he was the one in Genesis 18 that met Abraham by the road, who uh, Abraham made curds of the milk and the goat of the meat and fed them together and Yeshua ate them. You know, which is another fallacy of the meat and the milk theory, but that's all for another time. So what about the Holy Spirit? That's really the crux of what I want to talk about today. I've mentioned it in passing at other times, but I really want to mention it today and get into it because it's something that is very, very misunderstood in Christian circles and even Messianic circles of the, uh, the role of the Holy Spirit in the New Testament. Ephesians 4. Ephesians 4. We'll start from there. I'll read 1 through 6. Ephesians 4. Then I, the prisoner of our master, exhort you to walk worthily of the calling in which you were called, with all humility and meekness, with long suffering, bearing with one another in love, being eager to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, even as you were called in one hope of your calling. One Yahweh family, one faith, one baptism. One Elohim and Father of all, the one above all and through all and in you all. And I think I'll stop there. So we see, he's saying, there's one body, there's one spirit. So clearly, you know, the, uh, there is one spirit. There is one spirit. What is the Holy Spirit? And we're going to read it here. You never see the Holy Spirit, though, separated from Yahweh the Father. Well, Yeshua the Son. The Holy Spirit is what makes them one. And I say it's like, uh, it's his power, it's his essence. My name is Don, I'm made of flesh. But my flesh isn't separated from me. My flesh doesn't do its own thing. I can't go out and murder somebody and my defense wouldn't be, well, I didn't know what he was doing. You know, you can't put me in prison because I wasn't thinking about it. It was my flesh that did it. You know, they'd probably put me in the loony bin if that was my defense. You know, but it's, it's very clear. We're human beings. We're made of flesh. He's Yahweh. He's Elohim. He's made of spirit. But his spirit is not a separate entity from him. His spirit doesn't have free will. You know, you see Yeshua, what does he say? In the Garden of Gethsemane, Father, if there's any other way, but not mine will be done, but your will be done. Two separate wills. And that's what makes them ikad. Because Yeshua, in his own free will, has willingly submitted his will to the will of the Father. But you'll never see once in all of the, the scriptures, whether it's the Tanakh or the Prakadashah, you will never see the Holy Spirit acting independently of Yahweh on its own as a separate entity, which they try to make it out to be. It is the, the, the power of Yahweh. It's like his mind is what, what makes him think. It literally is what he is made of. It's not separate from him. It does not have a free will. And that's why the Father can take a piece of his mind, literally who he is, a piece of him, and put it in you, and you, and you, and you, and you. How do you do that with a person? You know, I saw that one time in the Bible. Do you remember? It was in the book of Judges. And there was an abominable act that happened. And they took this priest's wife and they 
abused her, and he cut her up into 12 pieces and sent it to the 12 tribes of Israel. Mm -hmm. can't do that with a human. You can't take a piece of a human and put it in somebody. But Yahweh takes a piece of him, a piece of his mind, a piece of his spirit, you know, and puts it in each one of us. And I'm going to say, can you imagine how you think? Do you, do you ever think against yourself? Do you ever fight with your own mind? You know, not if you're sane. You know, not if you're not bouncing off of, of, of uh, coated walls, you know. Nobody sits there and says, hey, you know what? I like that color. No, you don't. Yes, you do. No, your mind is your mind. You know, you have one mind. And that's the miracle of the new covenant, that Yahweh can actually take the mind, how he thinks, what he does, his love, his character, and put it in each one of us. But you know what we have to do? We have to do what Yeshua did. We have to submit. Whoa, Nelly. We have to submit our will, our human will, our fleshly will, you know, the will that Adam inherited from Satan of rebellion, we have to submit that will in order for him to work with us. And I've seen it happen, and I, I, I have uh, tapes I did from a couple of Passovers ago called The Promise 1, 2, 3, and 4, where I talk about this. But this is where it really gets neat. Because this is where I've seen it, where I can think something without even saying it. And somebody gets up and does what I'm thinking. This is where we come together and we all, as we speak, we all say the same thing. Not necessarily the same exact words, but the same character, the same action. That's where there'll be no offense. We don't get offended at ourselves, And there'll be a lot of messages coming on this. How do we submit our will so that the Spirit of Yahweh can work in us? But again, that Spirit, it's not a separate entity. It's not apart from Yahweh. It's not a triune Elohim, the way the paganism has made us see for thousands of years. The Trinity was never believed by the early believers. We have a course on the early congregation. You, you'll never see uh, ever in the early congregation a uh, idea of a triune Elohim. Uh, again, where it came in, I said, was Constantine 325, when Arius was bringing in this heresy that Yeshua never preexisted. And then they started talking, you know, all these philosophers. And if you look at the Catholic historians, look at Irenaeus, look at Justin Martyr, look at Tertullian, look at Jerome, they're all philosophers. You know, they're, they're, their premise, the, the person that they were following after was Plato. And they say they write their writings. So again, I don't know their heart. And I'm not judging their heart. But I'm telling you, their doctrine was not scriptural. And that's where most of Christianity today gets their doctrine from, is from these church fathers. Because they don't know of the, uh, the writings of the Paulicians and the Waldenses and the other true believers in the wilderness. But you will never see the Trinity as a belief of the early believers. It came in in the Council of Nicaea, and then it went all the way uh, until the Council of Chalcedon in 451 AD. So from like 325 to 451, it was being materialized until what you have today. <coughs> Basically, the early believers knew Yahweh is the supreme being. Yahweh is supreme over everything. And Yeshua, as the messenger of Yahweh at his right hand, like we just read, who accomplished his will, and the Holy Spirit is the power of Yahweh and his very breath. And we'll read some of the scriptures here. It's the very breath. It's the very life. That's what it is. His spirit is what makes life. His spirit is him. He is life. And literally what he is. Yeshua never even remotely referred to the Holy Spirit as a third person of the Elohim head. Not even remotely. When you look, you will never, ever, ever once in all of the Brit Hadashah ever see Yeshua praying to anybody but the Father in heaven. You'll never see him even talking. Can you ever even once see Yeshua speaking, verbally speaking, to the Holy Spirit? No, praying to the Holy Spirit, talking to him. He prayed only to the Father, <clears throat> never to the Spirit. Always spoke of the Father being greater than him. Never mention the Holy Spirit in these contexts. The Father is greater than Why? If the Holy Spirit is a third part of this, this, this trinity, why is he completely left out? And what I want to do now is I want to show you quite a few scriptures here just to prove my point that logically thinking to yourself, if the trinity really was a doctrine of Yahweh, how can it be left out of so many different things? How can it never be addressed in so many different ways? So let's start reading here. I want to go to, uh, I'll start in John 5, John 5, verse 19 through 23. 
It says, Then Yeshua answered and said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you that the Son is not able to do anything by his desire, but what he sees the Father, but what he sees that the Father does. For these things that the Father does, the Son also likewise does. For the Father loves the Son and shows to him all things which he does, and he will show him greater works than these in order that you may marvel. For even as the Father raises the dead and gives life, so also the Son gives life to whomever he wills. For the Father judges no one, but has given all judgment to the Son. So that all may honor the Son, even as they honor the Father. The one not honoring the Son does not honor the Father who has sent him. Now again, if, 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 if the Trinity is equal with that, you know, if it's triune, why don't you see any reference to the Holy Spirit in, in, in this context? You know, if they're saying like the egg, how many times have you ever opened an egg and there wasn't a yolk? You know? Doesn't happen that way, unless you got one deformed egg, maybe. Sometimes you can get a double yolk. But it's not like that. You would not see all these references to the unity of the Elohim head and only mentioning the Father and the Son if there was a <coughs> entity as part of that Elohim head as the Holy Spirit. Drop down to verse uh, 26. For even as the Father has life in himself, so he gave also the Son to have life in himself. Verse 30. I am not able to do anything of my desire, but as I hear, I judge, and my judgment is just, and I don't seek my will, rather the will of him who sent me. John 8, 28-29 Then Yeshua said to them, When you lift up the Son of Man, then you will know that I am, and from myself I do nothing. But as my Father taught me, these things I speak. And he who sent me is with me and does not leave me alone, because my Father is pleased at all times with the things that I do. And no mention of a third entity. Here. John 8, 17-19 And in your law it has been written that the witness of two men is true. Deuteronomy 19. I am the one witnessing concerning myself, and he who sent me, the Father, witnesses concerning me. Then they said to him, Where is your Father? Yeshua answered, You neither know me nor my Father. If you had known me, then you would have known my Father. No. Literally, it says in the mouth of two or three witnesses. Perfect way for Yeshua to come in and say, In the mouth of three witnesses, I am one witness, my Father is another, the Spirit is the third. Doesn't say it. Doesn't say it. And I would think if the Holy Spirit was equal and on par with Yeshua and the Son, then this would be fairly offensive. I mean, he's showing judicial order. He's showing the authority that's coming from heaven. And never, ever once mentioning the Holy Spirit. Never praying to the Holy Spirit. Never talking to the Holy Spirit. Never personifying the Holy Spirit as a person. So I know to Christians, it's like taking a piece of their heart away because they're brought up with this Trinity doctrine. But the bottom line is, if it's not scriptural, why hold on to something that was formed out of paganism that doesn't have scriptural proof to it? And this is what we're showing here. John 10, and verse 29 and 30. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all, and no one is able to snatch out of my Father's hand. I and the Father are one. Ikad. I and the Father are Ikad. Now you're talking about the unity of the Spirit. If the Holy Spirit was a person, certainly... When he's talking about the unity of it, you're going to see it there. And it's even going to be expanded more in John 17 here in a second. Zechariah 4 and verse 6. Actually, let's go, before I go to Zechariah, let's go to John 17. Let's go to John 17. And let's see that because, you know, sometimes people say if there was only, if there was only a chapter not just one verse here, and there. but if there was only a chapter in the Bible that can show us the unity of the Father, then it would be clear, right? So yeah, it's there, John 17. The whole chapter is only on the unity of the Elohim head. So I'm going to read here, I'll start in John 17, 1 through 5. Yeshua spoke these things and lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour has come, glorify your Son, that your Son may also glorify you. As you have gave to him authority over all flesh, so that to all which you gave to him, he may give to them everlasting life. And this is everlasting life, that they may know you, the Elohim of truth, and Yeshua Messiah, whom you've sent. Wow, why isn't he saying it also that they'll know the Holy Spirit? Not there. I have glorified you on the earth. I finished the work you gave me to do. And now, Father, glorify me with yourself, with the glory which I had with you before the existence of the world. No mention of a Holy Spirit as a third person. Let's drop down to verse 20. And I do not pray concerning these only, but also concerning those who will believe in me through their word, that all may be ikad, united, as you are in me, Father, and I in you, that they also may be ikad in us, 
that the world may believe that you sent me. And I have given them the glory which you have given me, that they may be ecod, as we are ecod, united. I and them, and you and me, that they may be perfected in one, and that the world may know that you sent me and love them, even as you love me. So here it is. I and you, and you and me, and us and them. I mean, man, this is the whole unity of it. Not a mention. Not a mention of the Holy Spirit as a person. I mean, come on. Man, if the Holy Spirit is really this, this above everything, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, there's no way that it would be a personified being and not be mentioned here. Impossible. Impossible. Why isn't it mentioned? Because it is Yahweh. I'm not downplaying the Holy Spirit. I believe in the Holy Spirit. But the Holy Spirit is Yahweh. It's His mind. It's His character. It's what He's made out of. So there's two beings here with the same mind, the same spirit. They're one in love. They're one in purpose. They're, they're, they're a God. One in unity. Romans 8. Romans 8. We'll see the same thing here. We'll actually see what the spirit of Yahweh is. What is the Holy Spirit? Can you separate the Holy Spirit from Yahweh and Yeshua? No. And I will show you the scripture right here that proves that. Romans 8 and verse 8. And those being in the flesh are not able to please Yahweh. But you are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, since the Spirit of Yahweh dwells in you. But if anyone is not the Spirit of Messiah, this one does not belong to him. But if Messiah is in you, the body indeed is dead because of sin, but the Spirit is life because of righteousness. But if the Spirit of the one having raised Yeshua from the dead dwells in you, the one having raised the Messiah from the dead will also make your mortal bodies live through the dwelling of His Spirit in you. Very clearly. Is it separated? Is it a separate entity? Of course not. He's saying, unless the Holy Spirit is in you, you're none of His. And then he says, if the Spirit of the Messiah is in you, it's the same Spirit. And then clearly he ends it here. The one having raised the Messiah from the dead will also make your mortal bodies live through the indwelling of His Spirit. The Spirit of the Father, the Spirit of the Son is the same Spirit, the Holy Spirit. It's not a separate entity. You cannot separate the Holy Spirit from the Father and the Son. Very, very clearly. Let's go to Zechariah 4. Let's start talking now what is the Holy Spirit. If it's not a person, if it's not a being, then what, what is it? How can we see that? What does it do? How does it act? Zechariah 4 and verse 6. Then he answered and spoke to them, saying, This is the word of Yahweh to Zerubbabel, saying, Not by the might, nor by power, but by my spirit, says Yahweh of hosts. Not by might, not by power, but by my spirit. So we see that the spirit works on behalf of Yahweh to fulfill his will. Isaiah 11, 2. Isaiah 11, 2. Talking about the spirit of Yahweh. And the spirit of Yahweh shall rest on him, on the Messiah. He will have the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and power, the spirit of knowledge and the fear of Yahweh. So again, now, if it's totally separate, what are we saying? Yahweh doesn't have these things? Yahweh doesn't have wisdom and understanding or counsel and power or knowledge? Of course not. It's the same spirit. But we see that the spirit of Yahweh rests on him. Rests on him. If it was a being, you know, I don't think anyone would want me resting on top of them all day. You get tired very quickly. So the Spirit of Yahweh rests on him. Acts 2.38 And Peter said to them, Repent and be baptized each of you in the name of Yeshua Yahweh for the forgiveness of sins, that you may receive the gift of the Spirit of holiness. It's a gift. The Spirit is a gift. And like I said, it's imparted. If it was a being, how can you take pick a being? But it's imparted, the Spirit through that. And very interesting, in the Aramaic, it says the name in the name of Yeshua Yahweh. Clearly, several times in the Aramaic scriptures, they clearly personify. That's not my translation. That's the exact word for word that it has in the Aramaic. Calling him several times, Yeshua Yahweh. 2 Timothy 1.6 For this reason, I remind you to stir up the gift of Yahweh which is in you through the laying out of my hands. Do you stir up a person? Yeah. Do you stir up a being? No. Of course not. John 20 and 21 in 22, then Yeshua said to them again, Peace be to you, as the Father has sent me, I also send you. And saying this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. And what is the word for spirit? In Hebrew, Ruach. Ruach HaKodesh, the set-apart spirit. So literally, and Ruach doesn't just mean spirit. Ruach literally means breath. 
Another way you can see that this is Aramaic here, he's playing that play on words, breath and spirit. That's what it is. It's the breath of Yahweh. Why? Because what happens when someone dies? How do you know if someone is really sick? How do you know when they die? Their breath stops. You know, sometimes they know no other way. They, they almost seem dead, but they, they, they can even hold their mirror up and they see a little bit of breath still in life. But then once that leaves, once there's no, once there's no ruach, once there's no breath that's in them. But of course, a breath certainly is not a being. And saying this, he breathed on them and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. 1 Thessalonians 5.19, do not quench the Spirit. So now we see the Spirit can be breathed, it can be poured out, it can be put upon, it can be quenched. How do you quench a person? How do you quench a being? <laughs> Doesn't make sense. Book of Job, Job 33.4. Job 33.4, the Spirit of El made me and the breath of the Almighty gives me life. Just like in Genesis 1. The Spirit of El made me in the breath of the Almighty, the Ruach, His Spirit, His breath. Job 34, 14, one page over. If He sets His heart on Him, if He gathers His Spirit and His breath to Himself, like I said, the dust we came, the dust we shall return. All we are is basically water and dirt until Yahweh breathes His rock on us, His breath. And then we become what? We become a nephesh. We become a living soul, a nephesh. Psalm 45 and verse 7. No, I'm gonna look, I'm gonna wait on that one. Let's go to Matthew 1. Another scripture that will clearly prove that the Holy Spirit could not be a being, or we have a big contradiction here. Matthew 1, I'm gonna start verse 18. Matthew 1 and verse 18. It says, And the birth of Yeshua Messiah was this way. For his mother Miriam had been betrothed to Joseph before the coming together of them. She was found having babe in womb by the Holy Spirit. Babe in womb by the Holy Spirit. But her husband Joseph, being just and not willing to make her a public example, he purposed to divorce her secretly. And as he was thinking about these things, behold, a cherub of Yahweh was seen by him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to make Miriam as your wife, for that in her is generated by the Holy Spirit. Now again, if you're going in the Christian tradition of three beings, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, as three separate entities, who is the Father of Yeshua? Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit. That's what it says here. So what would that mean? That would mean that Yahweh the Father is not his Father. So clearly, the Holy Spirit is not a being. But what this scripture clearly says is, the birth, her pregnancy, was generated by the Holy Spirit. Which shows us, you cannot separate Yahweh from His Spirit. You can't. You don't see it anywhere in scripture. You can't separate them. It's not in them. The Holy Spirit is the very beginning power of Yahweh. And again, if it was a person, then the Spirit would be the Father, not the, the Father. Another thing that's very interesting Grammatically speaking, uh, in Hebrew, and sometimes the grammar, like we saw with the tzitzit, tells us a lot of things. The grammar in the tzitzit is in the masculine, and it's not just in the, like I said, the uh, the word tzitzit, but it's in the garment, the noun, the verb, the adjective, which shows the tzitzit is for the man and not the woman. The woman is under the covering of the man. But in this case, when you look, it's really interesting because in the Greek, the uh, word Holy Spirit is in the masculine, but when you look at the form, it's more of an it than a him. But in the Aramaic and in the Hebrew, it's actually in the feminine. And somebody did a paper one time, really blasphemous to me as I read it. But it was saying, you know, we have a father and we have a son. Where is mommy? And trying to show that the Holy Spirit was a woman. You know, so... Uh, Clearly, if you just look from the, the gender of the language, though, if the Holy Spirit was an entity, it would not be in the feminine. That's for certain. And like I said, in the Greek, and you can even see in a lot of study notes where they put, because again, they're bringing their theology and they'll put he, any good study note will tell you in the grammatic form it said it really should be better rendered it. You know, because it's an adamant. It's not, it's not a being. It's, the, it's, it's, it's Yahweh, you know. When I see his spirit, I see Yahweh. I don't see them separated. So I'm not trying to downplay the power of the Holy Spirit or uh, what the Holy Spirit does, 
All I'm trying to say is that there's one spirit, there's a father, and there's a son, and there's one spirit that unites them, almost like a menorah, you know, and it's that spirit that is part of them. You can't separate the spirit from the father or the son. Uh, let's also, let's look at also in scripture some uh, symbolism of the Holy Spirit that you would not see if it was a person. And we already showed in Job that it symbolized his breath. Psalm 45, we see it symbolized as oil. We also see that in the New, New Testament. You love righteousness and hate wickedness. Therefore, Elohim, your Elohim, has anointed you with the oil of gladness more than your fellows. So we also see the Holy Spirit being uh, designated as oil. Matthew 3.11 says, I indeed baptize you in water to repentance. But he who is coming after me is stronger than me, of whom I am not worthy to remove the sandals. He will baptize you in the Holy Spirit and fire. So we see the Holy Spirit compared to fire. Same chapter, Matthew 3. If you go down to verse 16. And having been immersed, Yeshua went up immediately from the water. Behold, the heavens were opened to him, and he saw the Spirit of Yahweh coming down as a dove and coming upon him. Personified as a dove. If it was a being... You know, would Yeshua ever appear to somebody as an animal? I doubt it. <laughs> I doubt it. Yahweh made man in the image of him, and that's why he's given us dominion over the animals and whatnot. And that's why I say when you go in these churches and they're barking like dogs and vomiting and uh, doing every other weird thing they're doing, it can't be of Yahweh. Yahweh's spirit would never degrade you to perform like an animal, walk around like a chicken. It elevates us. To be the, the person we're supposed to be. It, 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 like I said, through His Spirit, it's making us one. And it's showing us how to love our neighbor. It's showing us when somebody hurts you, you don't vile back anger. It's showing us how to have the fruits of the Spirit, but certainly not to act like an animal. So again, the fact that the Holy Spirit came down as a dove, to me it would be another thing showing it's not personified. John 3.8. John 3.8. The wind will blow where it desires and you hear its voice, but you do not know from where it comes or where it goes. Likewise is everyone who is born from spirit. So we see the Holy Spirit being referred to as, as wind again. Same book, John 4 and verse 14. John 4 and verse 14. But everyone who drinks from the waters that I give to him will not thirst forever. But those waters that I give to him will become in him a spring of water that will spring up into life that is eternal. And we see that the spirit of Yahweh being uh, shown to be water. You know, we know that even with immersion, you know, living waters is, is, is spirit being life from waters. Ephesians 1 and verse 13. Ephesians 1 and verse 13. In whom you also have heard the word of truth, which is the good news of your salvation. In him you have believed, so you were sealed with the Holy Spirit that was promised. So we see it's a sealing also. The Holy Spirit is a sealing. Nothing, none of these things that you see as symbols would ever really be referred to a human. Same book, Ephesians 6 and verse 17. Also put on the helmet of salvation and take the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of Yahweh. Put on the helmet of salvation, take the sword of the Spirit. So we see again, symbolize the Spirit as, as a sword. Breath, oil, fire, dove, wind, water, seal, sword. You know, all things that are really good, and they're really good analogies and help us understand it, but certainly nothing in there that would make us think that it's it's personified, that it would be a being. Another thing that's very interesting, if we go into the letters of Paul, you know, I mean, if you look at most of Christianity's doctrines, whether it's the laws nailed to the cross or whatever other uh, things that they're believing, many of it comes from Paul's epistles, and wrongly so. You know, they misinterpret the epistles of Paul. One of the exciting things for me was doing this uh, new translation in the Aramaic was how easy to read Paul's letters are in the original language and how clear they are compared to the archaic language of the old King James or, or one of them. But let's look at Paul. Let's go to 1 Corinthians 1. Because Paul has basically 13 uh, epistles in the New Testament. And every epistle starts the same way. His salutation, his greeting. It's 
says, Paul, a called, 1 Corinthians 1.1, 1, 1, Paul, a called apostle of Yeshua Messiah by the will of Yahweh and Sathanes the brother, to the congregation of Yahweh, which is in Corinth. And that's what we say. Congregation of Yahweh is not something that's owned by me. It's not incorporated. It's not, you know, anything. It's, it's just what the congregation was called in Scripture. To the congregation of Yahweh, which is in Corinth, those having been sanctified in Messiah Yeshua called out saints with all those calling on the name of our Master Yeshua Messiah in every place, both theirs and ours. Grace to you and peace from Yahweh our Father and the Master Yeshua Messiah. Wow. Let's go to another one. I'm not going to go to every salutation, but you'll see everyone starts the same way. Go to Galatians. In the book of Galatians. Galatians 1. Galatians 1.1. 1, 1. Paul, an apostle, not from men, nor through man, but through Yeshua Messiah and Yahweh the Father, the one raising him from the dead. And all the brothers with me to the assemblies of Galatia. Grace to you and peace from Yahweh the Father and our Master Yeshua Messiah. Now, can you imagine, if Paul believed in the Trinity, and the Trinity was equal, you know, the Holy Spirit was equal with the Father and the Son, and, a, and, and literally a being, can you imagine the disrespect to write 13 epistles in every single epistle, greet the people in the name of the Father, in the name of the Son, and never mention the name of the Holy Spirit. To me, that, that's pretty dogmatic evidence that in Paul's mind, he's not thinking the Holy Spirit is a third part of, of, of some triune Elohim. You know? And it's not like some of their... Some, every one, every single epistle he writes, he starts the same way. So the absence of any salutation to the Holy Spirit clearly is showing Paul did not believe the Holy Spirit was a separate being from the Father and the Son. Acts 4. Let's go to Acts 4. I'll read verse 8 and then verse 31. Then being filled of the Holy Spirit, Peter said to them, Rulers of the people and elders of Israel, listen. And then he goes on to tell them things, and then verse 31, And they having prayed, Acts 4, 31, The place in which they were gathered was shaken, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and spoke the word of Yahweh with boldness. So we see here that the Holy Spirit, far from being excluded, you know, we're filled with it. It's the very thing, like Yeshua said, He'll send us the Comforter. That literally the spirit of Yahweh enters us, and it's that spirit that's bringing us, like we said, to be be like Him. But by far, in in the Brit Hadashah, the New Testament, you you never see scriptures where the Holy Spirit is being addressed or being salutated as if it was a separate. <coughs> it's just not there if people are honest with themselves. What I want to do is I'm not gonna. I don't have too much more to go. Another few minutes, but I do want to go over two mistranslations that people come up with. Then we could we'll turn off when we're done the uh, video and we can mid rash if there's any questions or comments or anything else. First one I want to go to is First John five. That's usually the first place that uh, people come up with. And does anybody here have a King James Bible or the New King James? New King James. Okay. Because I want you to read it in there, and then I'm going to read it from the original. <coughs> first John. John 5, 7 and 8. Can you read that, Kevin? Sure. Well, there are three that bear witness in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Spirit, and these three are one. And there are three that bear witness on earth, the Spirit, the water, and the blood, and these three agree as one. Thank you. So, from that scripture, that's usually the first scripture someone will come up with, now again, even that scripture alone, you know, doesn't dogmatically say there's a trinity, but you know, you could misinterpret it from that scripture. The problem with that scripture is it's not in any manuscript or any ancient manuscript. It was added uh, in the 4th or 5th century, it was put in there, and even after it was added in the 4th and 5th century, it was not in any manuscript of the Bible that was printed. The first time it came in was after the 15th century, that it started coming into the Latin Vulgate, which is probably the worst manuscript that you can get, but you do not see that, and actually, if anybody, or anybody that will hear this, this will go all over the world, if you have a study Bible and you read your study notes, mostly every good Bible study 
Bible translation or Bible study Bible will tell you right off the bat that that scripture was not in there to begin with. I'm going to read it now the way it was. And, and, and not only, I'm not just saying the Aramaic, I'm talking about the Greek translation. It is neither in the Aramaic or the Greek. It is in no manuscript. And there's over 14,000 Aramaic, uh, not Aramaic, uh, Greek manuscripts. Over 14,000 Greek manuscripts. And that scripture is not in any of them. At least the way that it's read in the King James. But I'll read it the way it is, and I'll tell you how it was doctored. First, John 5, 7 and 8. And the Spirit is the one witnessing, because the Spirit is the truth. And there are three who bear witness. The Spirit, the water, and the blood. And these three are one. They're God. So that's the way it should be, that the Spirit is bearing witness. And what is it saying? It's talking about our baptism. That's what this is talking about. It's talking about that through accepting the blood of Yeshua and being immersed in water, you're going to get the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit is going to be the witness. That's the way you know if someone's a believer or not. How much fruit are they bearing? 20 years down the line, we can all say, you know what, I received the Holy Spirit when I was 5. I received it when I was 2. But the Holy Spirit will witness against itself that we are the sons of Yahweh, like it says in the book of Romans. So this is the point that John is trying to make. That by accepting the blood of Yeshua and being immersed in water and receiving the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit is the witness that He's living in us. Because there's going to be a change in the person. And to me, when I look at the fact that they actually had a doctor in the Bible and add that scripture in, what does it tell you in your mind? You know, be Sherlock Holmes, think it's functional. It tells you there can't be a lot of good scriptures for the Trinity. <laughs> if you have to actually add something that's not even in scripture to try to prove your point, then there can't be a lot of good things in there. Would we have to, if you're going out and you're trying to talk to a Sunday keeper on why Saturday is the Sabbath, do you need to, to add a scripture in? Of course not. We've got so much ammunition there. All you got to do is read scripture, and it's pretty evident. But the fact that this was added in in the 4th, 5th century, and like I said, even when it was added, it was not accepted all the way then until the Latin Vulgate. Only one that, that actually accepts it in any good study Bible. So, so that scripture really doesn't hold water. You know, it was put in there. It's not in any original manuscripts. It shouldn't be in there. The other one is Matthew 28. Matthew 28. Kevin, if you would be kind enough, I'll ask you to read that for us. Matthew 28, and you could read verse 18 through 20. <clears throat> And Yeshua came and spoke to them, saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and earth. Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and of the Holy Spirit. You can continue. Yep. Teaching them to observe, observe all things that I have commanded you. And lo, I am coming, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. So again, this is another scripture that people will bring up in defense of the Trinity. And even if it was the way that Kevin said, if, if that was the correct translation, to me it's not a proof of a trinity to begin with. If someone is being immersed in the name of the Father and the Son, and uh, by Yahweh's power of His Holy Spirit, I don't see a problem in it to begin with. But, uh, you've got to remember in the original languages, whether it is the Greek or the Aramaic, they do not have... Uh, punctuation of commas and these different things. And I believe, in my translation, I put it a little bit different, which I think was the intent and what it should be from the original, and it's like this. Uh, Matthew 28, 18. And coming up, Yeshua talked with them, saying, All authority in heaven and earth was given to me. Then having gone, disciple all nations, baptizing them into the name of the Father and the Son, and the Holy Spirit teaching them to observe all things, whatever I command you. And behold, I am with you all the days until the completion of the age. And I think that fits with the other scriptures in John where Yeshua is saying what? Unless I go, the Comforter can't come to you. And it's the Comforter of the Holy Spirit that will lead you into all truth. So it's not that we're baptizing in the personage of the Holy Spirit. No, it's that we're being immersed in the family name of Yahweh, Yahweh Yeshua, the Father and the Son. And then once His Spirit comes in you, it's the Holy Spirit that's teaching you all truth. And that's why some of these things, you can talk to people till you're blue in the face, unless the Holy Spirit is opening up someone's mind, all of us. We're not smart people. I'm not smart. Anything we know is because Yahweh's Spirit has opened our mind to it. 
But by far, whatever way they, they read this, whether it's the way I just read it or the other way, I don't, I don't, I don't see that as, as any kind of uh, dogmatic proof of a trinity. And particularly with all the other scriptures that we've been going over, that it seems, uh, you know, that I, I feel what happens is, and this is, we say, the worst type of archaeologist you can be is when you're looking for something. Hmm. That's not a good archaeologist. If you're going and you're going to do a dig somewhere and you're you're looking, you're thinking, well, I'm going to dig this because the table of showbread might be there. That that that's those are treasure hunters. Those are Indiana Jones. That's not archaeology. Archaeology is you go to a spot that you know is a biblical spot. You know, like we talked about Tel Shalom. We know from that place that uh, you know there was uh, John the Baptist was baptizing there. We know it was water. It's never been dug. So you go there with anticipation that you know this is a biblical place, but you don't know what you're going to find. And then you let the finds be the facts. The time it's dated, you can tell from the pottery and the coins, the things you're finding, the inscriptions, just like the, the, the Temple Mount. You know, like I said, nothing they've ever found in the Temple Mount ever proving that where they're pulling the Temple Mount is the Temple Mount. So it's the same kind of thing. You can't go into it if you're doing a, a translation, which many of them have, King James and these others, they have a theology before they do their translation. So what they're going to do, they're going to translate according to the theology, and in a lot of cases, you know, it's not literal. And when it's a translation, as, as important as, as, as the Holy Scriptures, you've got to be literal. You can't paraphrase. You can't change it into your own words, because it's actually sin. It's actually against Scripture. No Scriptures of any private interpretation. And that's what I try to do in, in the Tanakh. I took every single word in Scripture and looked it up not only in the Hebrew, but looked it up in lexicons and concordances. It doesn't mean there's not, there can't be mistakes there, but it means that I took serious doing every single word to try to be as literal as possible in the application that Yahweh gave us. Not taking my own liberty to say, well, you know something, I believe this would better be fit this way. No, you know, you're trying to keep it in the original context of what it says. So, uh, those are the only two that I really know that would be come at believers if you were talking. I mean, there's going to be other things where, you know, they're going to say, you know, the, and, and uh, like he says, I will send the comforter. Well, is, is that a per Well, none of those things show that a comforter, the Holy Spirit is being sent, literally means it's got to be a person or not to be a person. You know, you have to put all these scriptures together. But it's, it's the same way when somebody is against the Torah. I say, let's start first with a premise. I'll show you a hundred scriptures that say the Torah is there forever. So whenever we talk about after those hundred scriptures, don't tell me the Torah isn't there in the New Covenant. <laughs> we've already proved, we've already established that it's there forever. So once you establish a fact by a hundred scriptures, you can't keep going back and saying, well, you know, it's something else. So if you think it says that it's not there forever, you either misinterpreted it or it's mistranslated. Because we've already established the fact it's there forever. And it's not by one or two scriptures. So the same way here. I think today, I think I've established... And there's even a lot more that I could go into, but I don't want to belinger the point. But I think I established the fact of showing clear-cut dogmatic scriptures that would, without a shadow of a doubt, prove the Holy Spirit is not a separate entity apart from Yahweh and Yeshua. But it is literally what they are, who they are. It's their spirit. It's what makes them one. It's what goes out and uh, enables them to come into us, to be part of us. But it doesn't have its own... Uh, mind as far as thinking separate from Yahweh, you know, it's it's whatever Yahweh says, the Spirit goes out and completes. It's not a separate entity from the Father and the Son. I'll go over one more scripture and we'll end, and it's in Ephesians 5.5. 5. Ephesians 5 and verse 5. For you should know this, that no one guilty of fornication, nor unclean person, nor a covetous, covetous one, nor an idolater, has any inheritance in the kingdom of Messiah and Yahweh. So very clearly, everything comes down to what? The end result, the kingdom, the kingdom coming, and what does he say? He doesn't say the kingdom of Messiah and Yahweh and the Spirit. He says the kingdom of Yahweh and Messiah. We read already, I could have read at least another eight or nine scriptures. You could look them up yourself. There's a throne in heaven right now. The Father is sitting at the right. The, the Father is sitting on His throne. The Son is sitting on the right of Him. 
You will never see anywhere in Scripture at all ever talking about a third entity of a Holy Spirit sitting somewhere next to Yeshua or somewhere in the throne. So again, I think if we're honest with ourselves uh, and we look at the Scriptures and what they say, the Holy Spirit is the, the very mind of Yahweh and Yeshua that He imparts to us to think like He thinks and become like Him. If somebody still wants to believe the Holy Spirit is a, uh, a third person, that there's Yahweh, Yeshua, and the Holy Spirit, uh, although I believe it's biblically inaccurate, I don't think it's the worst thing in the world. But if somebody believes in the Trinity, the real Trinity, if they believe there's only one being, Yahweh, and that the Son is just an aspect of the Father's personality, the way the Spirit is another aspect, then really they're, they're, they're denying that there's a Son. And again, like we've read in John to begin with, unless you have the Father and the Son, it is the Spirit of Anti-Messiah. It's, it's uh, replacing the Spirit of Messiah. So, Andy, we could shut off the uh, video and we will have some midrash. <coughs>